Well, I'm going to sit down if you don't mind. Um, and I think, John, you're happier sitting. Yes, aren't you? yes. Yeah. Um, I'd <coughs> just like to say thank you to Alison for that because I found it very inspiring. Um, and I heartily endorse what she has said about John, and it totally corresponds with my memory of John over the years, many years. I, I've known him ever since he first moved up to Glasgow. Uh, <coughs> I, I, John, I, I wonder if we could start um, at the beginning uh, with your first university degree. Um, could you tell us how you came to be a sociologist? We hear a great deal about the development of sociology at LSE, um, but you can perhaps cast a rather different light on British sociology, <coughs> um, uh, at any rate, as it was in the late 50s yes, when you first yes. encountered it. Yes, yes. Well, Bridget, the answer to your question is that I became a sociologist by luck. And uh, <laughs> that's a good Such sociological a concept, which yeah. I recommend to anybody. <laughs> it was luck. And uh, the reason was that I was conscripted into the Air Force under national conscription. I left in a week having been diagnosed with a perforated ear. My headmaster said, oh, you did history. Would you like to do, and you did economics, would you like to do a, a London BSc economics at um, Leicester University College? And I said, oh, that sounds okay. So um, I went up to Leicester, not really knowing what I was going into or whatever. I knew there was history and I knew there was economics and that was fine. What I didn't know was there was sociology. And what happened was I was assigned a tutor who turned out to be Elia Neustadt, who was sociologist. Mm. And uh, I was going to say he and I got on like a house on fire, but we actually argued like ferrets in a sack very often. <laughs> and we had these great arguments but he was terrific, and um, he set me an essay on <coughs> the idea of progress. Well, when you're 18 years old, you know all about the idea of progress, and I said, there are three, there are three theories of the idea of progress, and he wrote in the margin, there are 27. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was one and truly put in my place. And it was through him that I decided to take up sociology, which you could then do in the third year as part of the BSc economics. And that is how I took it up. And I just kept myself very fortunate that that happened. And of course, I fell in love with the subject. And the um, the, the, the main teachers were Elia Neustadt himself and um, Norbert Elias and uh, Ernest Gellner. And when I think <laughs> back on that, I just think, how lucky is that yeah. to have had people of that caliber and knowledge and commitment to teach? Um, Neustadt was a very, very good teacher and he loved his subject, he loved Comte, difficult to get him away from Comte, but he did teach us all these other people, especially Weber and so on, and Pareto and all these people. And it was no surprise to me that when he became a professor, his inaugural lecture was entitled Teaching Sociology. I have a signed copy here, if anybody would like to have a look at it. But it's, it's, a, it's a beautifully expressed lecture on the importance of teaching sociology and of engaging with students in ways that really mattered. And so uh, he was a very, very fine teacher. And then, of course, there was Elias, who was um, 
a, a very, very, a very, very committed Freudian, and um, had written wonderful things that I knew nothing about at that time. And um, he subsequently became my supervisor when I went on to, to do an MA, MA. But he was um, he was a bit pedantic, um, and he would correct you after every sentence. Really, he, he's one of these people who, because English was not his first language, he had a great respect for it, and he would correct you in uh, many detailed and pedantic ways. So, and then there was Gellner, who was extraordinary. I mean, Gellner was someone who at that time was writing what was his first book, Words and Things, which was a heavy, heavy critique of uh, Wittgenstein. And he came in and he lectured us on this, and we didn't understand what he was on about. <laughs> and uh, he said at the end of the first lecture, I'm going out for a smoke now, and when, I, when I come back, I want you to talk about it with me. And we looked at one another, all eight of us, that was all we had. And what are we going to say to this man, you know? But I, I found that he was very, very receptive and, uh, and prepared to engage you in conversation uh, and in a way which was very, very helpful. So, and Gellner, by the way, turned out to be um, a, an anti-Freudian, wrote a very good book on psychoanalysis. And um, I never was privy to any conversations he had with Norbert Elias, but I imagine they could have been a bit sparky. <coughs> so, so the answer to your question, Bridget, is that that's where it started. But I did want to say a little bit about Elias and Neustadt. These two men were like peas in a pod, and they were very great friends. And when they wrote letters to each other, they always started off, my dear Elia, or my dear Norbert. You know, and then they had these very affectionate things which were talking about the departments, the developments of the subject, what they should do. But there was one bit here which I did want to share with you because it reveals something about the two of them and how they were interdependent as people. This is, this is Norbert. My dear Elia, I want you to do something for me. You remember the English translation of Comte's first chapter, which I use so often in my courses. I want you to edit this. All that needs doing is to check the text with the original and to write a short introduction which can concentrate on two or three points. You are the obvious choice to do it and I must absolutely insist that you find time for it. It will give you great pleasure when you have done it and it will give great pleasure to me. Now, the thing was, Neustadt had a writing block and he just couldn't, he just couldn't get on with the writing. It was a bit sad. He was a brilliant man, a brilliant teacher, but he wouldn't have done very well in the, in the research review <coughs> process, okay? And what does um, Neustadt say to, to him? He says to, uh, he says to Norbert, I was very glad to know that you are getting on with your things, by which I take it that something is likely to be ready for publication. Am I right? I hope I am. And I hope that you do keep it in mind that when all is said and done, you might as well disregard everything I've said in this letter and get on with what is the paramount thing of all, both for you and for everybody, namely, get out as much of your stuff as possible for public use. It's the best possible service you can render the present time to anybody. Now, I find that a lovely exchange because... Elias had a writing block too at that time. <laughs> Not too surprising because he'd come through the war and his parent, he'd lost his parents in the uh, concentration camp and all of that horror. And he was having trouble writing. So there are the two of them encouraging one another, get on with it, you know, you're doing yourself a, a service and the public a service. And so there they were. It, it, it's sad to record that they did have a breakdown in their friendship later in life. But we'll not talk about that. Um, no, so that's what and, I want um, to say. Many impressive sociologists have emerged from that milieu. In oh, very, very much so. Very much so. John, um, of course, but yes. others as oh, well. The, yes, and this was Leicester became a seedbed for teaching. You talked about LSE, which of course was very important, and I've written about that recently. But but mm. but 
Leicester did become a seedbed for the teaching of sociology, which Elias and Neustadt took very, very seriously, and they worked out the um, the programs and the syllabuses and all the rest of it for a kind of uh, developmental comparative sociology. And they they did attract people. Actually, when it became a much bigger enterprise, it became more difficult to attract them because things were spreading out <coughs> elsewhere and they were losing people as well as getting them. But there were people like Tony Giddens and John Goldthorpe and Richard Brown. And Richard Brown remains something of a, a role model for me, I have to say. Uh, a man of great altruism and wisdom and commitment to his subject. Um, Tony Giddens, it was said that he gave all his lectures without any notes. And um, he was, um, people, the students used to sit with him having coffee <coughs> to make sure that he didn't have his notes in his pocket and that he wasn't going to draw them out. He didn't have any time to prepare with him, but he, when it came to the lecture, he just went in, delivered the lecture. Very impressive. Um, uh, also quite, quite, quite daring. And, um, but that was, um, that was Tony Giddens, who was a very good lecturer, lecturer, but not as good, I think, as Stuart Hall, who for me was um, top of the pops when it came to lecturing. But that's another well, story. Uh, I agree he, with he you was about fantastic. that. Yeah. But he wasn't at Leicester. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we could um, move on to more theoretical issues, John. Um, I always think of you as a radical Weberian, um, not least uh, because of your early mm. 70s book, Max Weber, The Interpretation of Social Reality, which Alison alluded to. I wonder if you could say something about how you see Weber and how you wanted then, at that time, to rest him from what we might call, to use his own phrase, the icy fingers um, of American functionalist sociology. Yeah, yeah. It was um, Raymond Aron who spoke about Weber in a celebration conference as our great contemporary. And I think that Weber is still our great contemporary because what he has to say in terms of how sociology should be attended to and uh, worked through is still very, very relevant. He was a man who believed in a subject which should be empirically grounded and theoretically informed. And to do those two things together are, are really significant. Sometimes people can go into high flights of speculative fancy and it can all be very high sounding as in some discussions of uh, post-modernity these days. But actually to have something which is empirically grounded offers explanation for the phenomena that are being looked at. That is an incredible thing. Now I came into Weber, I suppose, first of all, through the Protestant ethic and spirit of capitalism. Most people w would have done that. Uh, and also by the essays produced by Gerth and Mills, pr published by Gerth and Mills. But I thought that the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism was a, was a wonderful thing. And what I loved about it were the footnotes. I loved the fact that there was this great subtext of footnotes in which uh, work which he first of all put into a journal in, in individual papers came together as a book. But because they came as a journal, People were making comments and criticisms and were giving them a hard time. And he responds to all these in the footnotes. So what you have is a kind of a dialogue and a conversation, um, which is quite extraordinary and quite exhilarating. So the longest subtext in history in this of sociology. Absolutely wonderful. So, so that's how I came in, into, into thinking about Weber and, and thinking how remarkable it was that he could do such original stuff. Um, but, of course, if you read um, uh, Parsons' tra translation or part translation of Economy and Society, what you find is that Parsons is basically saying, well, yes, Weber was really important, but 
he never got round to writing the social system, which is of course what Parsons wrote. He, he said, and and he, he and the, the trouble is, he didn't develop his system, and he didn't really have, as you say, Bridget, a functionist orientation. When I, Weber actually dealt with that, and he basically said, yeah, it's all right to have a functionist <coughs> orientation to start with, but you've got to go on beyond that, and you've got to go to explanations that are adequate at the level of meaning and causally adequate. That's the crunch. Those two things the subjective meanings and the concern to <coughs> establish causality as far as you could. And Weber, <coughs> you know, it's all right to start with kind of some functional orientation, but there's no, no place to stop. And um, I think <coughs> it was El Albert Salomon who said, uh, you know, any, any sense of, um, any criticism of Weber because he doesn't have a, a system approach is misplaced and misguided because he never wanted it. In fact, he, he, he deliberately eschewed it. So, you know, it's as though Parsons was saying, if only he'd been a bit more like me and written something like the social system, he would have been a, a really, really good sociologist. But I'm saying, well, because he wasn't like you, he was an even better sociologist, <laughs> right? That's the difference. And uh, he was, um, he, he, he was extraordinary. And then the, 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 the other thing to notice about Weber is that um, when you look at the Protestant ethic, you can see a very focused piece of work, a very deliberate and, and very important, but it, it's significant to see in a comparative context. What Weber was interested in fundamentally, as you probably know, was how was it that capitalism emerged in Western Europe and how, how did that happen? So one of the things that he then got going on was a comparative work that looked at the religion of India, the religion of China, ancient Judaism, goodness knows what. And, and, and he brings in a, a, an extraordinary comparative sociology to try and pin down what was it that was distinctive about uh, the emergence of capitalism in, in, in Western Europe. And that sense of looking at the particular and the distinctive rather than the universal is something which I think was, was really important. So I think that Weber stands as an iconic figure in terms of what it is to be a sociologist and what it is to do it. If you look at the Girth and Mills, the Girth and Mills um, series of essays, there are two wonderful essays in there one called Science as a Vocation and the other one called Politics as a Vocation. I heard Tony Giddens say once that he, he read those essays once every year and that's not bad advice actually. Um, they are terrific um, essays on the whole sense of sociology as a calling and what is demanded from it. And I think that that, that sense of of the importance of the subject and the importance of dealing with issues of values and ethics, which he dealt with in very impressive ways, particularly his distinction between absolute ethics and um, the, uh, the 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 um, the ethics of of, um, uh, of of expediency and so on. That I think was something which was extremely significant and, and actually kind of guided him in his own thinking and writing. So I hope, Bridget, that gives you some sense yes, of what I feel about that. It certainly does. I don't think he had that emphasis that Parsons had on consensus, uh, which is perhaps um, what you're alluding to with the notion of the system. Um, no, that's right. And <coughs> for him, <coughs> values could clash and oh, was absolutely. situationally based. Um, so again, a very sharp departure from the set of assumptions that Parsons would later oh, absolutely. adopt. Absolutely, and his whole discussion of rationality and distinction between formal and substantive rationality yeah. and the, the conflicts of values and interests, which all that, as it were, exemplifies and so on, that was what he set out to understand and yeah. to explore. Yeah. And I think that is a that that offers an image of of what it is to look at 
social social reality and how to develop a, 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 a sociology interpretation of social reality. That's what he mm. that's what he wanted to accomplish, and um, and he did it in style. And um, I, I, I mean, to me, it's amazing that this man who died before he was sixty and had uh, two or three breakdowns on the way managed to produce as much as he did extraordinary stuff and essays on methodology which I used to hesitate to um, teach to students because I thought they were really pretty hard going but as the more I thought about it I thought the essays on methodology were really valuable and so I did encourage students to to read the text on the methodology of the social sciences and so on and what he has to say about ideal types and and uh, causation and all of these things um, really really valuable so when it comes to Weber and all the other sociologists read <coughs> the text read the text mm. no substitute mm. well in the 1960s if we could backtrack a little bit from the Max Weber book in the 1960s you were at Durham University um, and I'd like to ask you about your work there on the heavy industries of the Northeast. I know you didn't just look at Durham itself, but um, at shipbuilding, um, steel production, and mining. Um, and this work eventually culminated in the 1968 book, a little bit before the Weber one, on industrial disputes, just simply called industrial disputes. Um, I see that, it doesn't require any great brains, as leading to the late set, later setting up of the University of Glasgow Center for Industrial Democracy, um, where you worked uh, with John McInnes, who I think is here, um, maybe not here yet, no, um, and um, <coughs> with uh, Pete Cressy, who unfortunately can't be here, uh, and uh, with Laurie Hunter, um, uh, who came from uh, an economics background. Yes. Can you say something about your experience of experiments in industrial democracy, um, uh, particularly in, uh, in relation to the, the firms that were initiating some uh, elements of industrial democracy, <coughs> and, and what the barriers were to implementing this further? Yeah, that's, um, that's a whole clutch of things there. I'll do my mm. best. Mm. I think um, the experience of working in Durham was really important to me. Uh, and I worked mostly with the economists. And that kind of collaborative, and particularly I would mention uh, Gordon Cameron, who some of you will remember, became professor here. and. Um, I still mourn his passing, and he was an um, applied economist, and in fact we wrote an article on unofficial strikes together for the British Journal of Sociology, and uh, it was something that we wrestled over and so on. I seem to remember that it was refused by the editor of the British Journal of Industrial Relations as being too ideological, but there you go. Um, anyway. The thing about Durham was, at that time, one of the leading industrial sociologists was uh, Joan Woodward, who wrote stuff on management and technology and so on. And uh, we were trying to understand whether there were different, f different expressions and manifestations of conflict or the different intensities of conflict in different industries. So that is why we went into steel and uh, shipbuilding and heavy engineering and of course it was very detailed empirical work and very demanding sometimes very tiring um, but um, what, a, what, I f what I feel about it was it, that, it, that it was empirical and what I gained from it was a tremendous respect for the people that, that I interviewed I just thought 
there was something remarkable about the way in which they conducted themselves in their daily lives. And so the attempt to try and understand industrial relations in those industries did demand um, a lot of attention, a lot of scrutiny, and an attempt to try and offer a detached analysis of what was going on in terms of conflict and friction and so on and so forth. Um, I think that um, when I came to Glasgow some years later, uh, that actually the um, experience of of all of that stuck with me, mm. and uh, I would add, by the way, that the also the experience of teaching workers education at that stage, mm. where you become very close to people who are involved in productive activities and you come to understand the significance of what they're doing and also the nature of the conflict which sometimes emerges from it and so mm. all of that to me was, was, was valuable. Now coming to Glasgow actually there is a little bit before you, you, in the, before you asked the second bit about the Centre for Industrial Democracy mm. I was also involved in setting up a project on worker directors and this was a project mm. which had several investigators Ken Alexander, I remember George Thomason uh, and Michael Barrett Brown and we were all involved and people like Peter Brannan were involved in in exploring what was happening to worker directors and in, in, in particularly in the steel industry and this proved to be a very detailed study which was published but also slightly disappointing because the question of worker directors made issues of industrial democracy look rather superficial. When we began our work in Glasgow, and um, I, can't, I can't speak highly enough of Peter Cressy and uh, John McInnes and all the research work that they did, but when we began that work, it was to try and understand more about participation and one of the things we found was that when you went in to interview people they would tell you in glowing terms how much they were in favour of industrial participation, occasionally democracy, that's a different thing, how much they were in favour of industrial participation. But when you got down to the nitty gritty it all evaporated and so we described this as the evaporation of enthusiasm. It was an extraordinary <laughs> thing. Everybody thought it was, participation was wonderful, but when it came to it, they didn't, actually, um, they didn't actually practice it. So what we then did was we went into several different companies and, um, uh, and, and we did case studies of these, co of these companies and produced uh, really what was ethnographic work of what was going on and of course then you then begin to find out much more about the processes of um, participation and what they really add up to. If I just perhaps make a couple of observations mm. on that. In one case okay. we went to a company which had decided that they didn't need unions because everybody was one big happy family and it was all <laughs> hunky-dory. You didn't need unions and they all met together and um, it was joint consultation here, there and everywhere. Until one fine day, the order came down from the multinational bosses in, uh, in mm -hmm. the States that the, the, the workers had to accept, uh, I think it was a 17% pay cut. And they had two days to vote on this, be democratic, you understand, two days to vote on it. And if they didn't, um, if they didn't support it, then the company would move across <coughs> to Holland. Now, that of course exploded the whole concept of the happy family. And the, many of the local management were, um, were very, uh, uh, felt, felt, felt betrayed by this. So these were the kinds of things that happened. And then in, the, in another case, um, an electronics firm, which was very healthy and very, very strong, um, in, the, in this market situation 
actually had a, a situation where it was a kind of organic management, the kind of things that Tom Burns had written about and we knew about. But what we found was that underneath that, underneath that um, very open, organic form of decision making, was a strong bureaucratic undertow with control from the very top, and things had to relate to that. So, the the sense of what was going on in that company was very much helped by its its place in the market situation was going very very well. But recently, of course, they've come unstuck, but much, much more recently, and all that stuff has become unstuck. So industrial dem participation is something people talk about, but they lose the enthusiasm for very often. Industrial democracy is another story. And um, in a word, its failure has something to do with capitalism. <laughs> Some of us won't be surprised by that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you touched there on the fact that you have done collaborative work um, and a considerable amount of collaborative work in your career, um, uh, not least in just managing authority and democracy in industry in 1985, which is the fruit of that research with um, John McInnes, and I'm sorry he's not here, and, and Pete Cressy. Um, but you also developed uh, this further in the work you did in the Science, Religion and Technology um, Center of the yes, Church of Scotland, yes, 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 or yes. the unit of the <coughs> Church of <coughs> Scotland. Uh, which was on issues to do with ethics, which we would associate with you, but um, perhaps def defense uh, also, which maybe many people wouldn't know you had an interest in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, thinking about it, it could be said that this collective teamwork approach, sometimes in conjunction with a comparative method, has been one of the hallmarks of your research um, and clearly a very great asset. I wonder whether you have any reflections on this um, and especially ones that you could offer to the young sociologists in the room. Well, I am... Um a great believer in collaborative work, I think that, um, and sometimes interdisciplinary work. I think if you're a sociologist, you want to hold your corner and you fight your corner and all the rest of it, and that's great. But I think to be able to communicate across the disciplinary borders is important. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I think that my experience with collaborative work um, uh, expresses that, and, mm -hmm. and I feel that very very strongly. Um, in in the case of uh, in the case of the in the industrial work, yes, uh, we've worked with uh, economists and um, and so on. But I'd like to say something, if I may, about the media work. Would yeah, well, I was going right? to come on to that. Yes, yes. yeah, yes. yeah. Um, because that again was collaborative work. And um, I moved into that partly as a result of working in the field of industrial relations and so on. Um, and I just want to say that I'm delighted to see Brian Winston here today because he was the first director of the media project, the Bad News Project. And um, he was a, he, he was a great example to us of how to meet deadlines when <laughs> an academic some aren't very good at meeting deadlines but he was brilliant and and of course had all the knowledge the inside knowledge of broadcasting and production and that made such a difference so that kind of collaboration to my mind is um is 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 very significant so bear in mind if you will that a lot of sociologists, certainly in my generation, didn't 
I mean, they didn't always start off as sociologists anyway. Max Weber started off as an economist, for goodness sake, and a lawyer. Um, and I think that uh, to recognize that we can collaborate on a project that matters sufficiently to us to give it our best shot is really, is re is really, really important. So, um, yeah, collaboration is something to be welcomed and, um, and sustained rather than something to, to shy away from. But I would say that it should spring from a strong sense of one's own discipline and, and not some shallow kind of well, there's this and there's that. Mm. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether there are also any unanticipated consequences of collaboration. Um, um, we could all think of um, perhaps personalities sometimes rubbing each other up yeah. the wrong way. But um, uh, one pa problem perhaps is that uh, members of research teams can leave and go to other universities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fair to point out that with any, within any research group uh, that's working together, there will be differences of opinions. Sometimes these will be very strong and um, can be quite divisive. But I guess you just have to be mature enough to kind of work through that and live with that um, and hope that it all doesn't Im implode, as it were, you know. So I think that, um, that, that that's what I would bear in mind. But, uh, but there is another issue, which is that, and I felt this very strongly, that as someone who, who was in a tenured position, um, <coughs> I was involved and in some sense responsible for people who were on contract. And the whole business of the development of contracts was always a problem. So that, so that I always felt in a position whereby I had to... Um, move uh, as best I could to try and sustain people's contracts and work and try and get more grants and all the rest of it, the bread and butter of, of getting research grants. But for all that, we would still lose people. And sometimes we lost them, if I may say so, in these hallowed precincts through managerial decisions above me. I once lost them. Um, <laughs> I once lost a very, very good researcher, and uh, she is now a professor in um, in in another country, even um, Wales. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she, um, I, I, I was very, very keen that we employ her. You see, and uh, but I failed, <coughs> and I remember writing to the principal and saying what pipsqueak has got in the way of making this appointment? And he wrote back to me and he said, it doesn't help to call the dean and the principal a pipsqueak. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, uh, but I mean, and th th this is a rough and tumble of, um, of, of things, you know, the research contract problem, trying to bring people onto more permanent work and so on and so forth. But, I suppose the, the flip side of that is that these people, when they do leave and they've been trained and worked through with us, they go to other positions and, it's, and we have offered a seedbed, as it were, and they have gone to other places and done very, very good things indeed. And of course, it's always a matter of <coughs> delight and pleasure to see <coughs> what they have done. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well. Uh, you did touch on the media group, mm -hmm. and I want to go on to that now. You're perhaps most in the public eye for helping to establish, with others like Brian Winston, whom you've mentioned, and Greg Philo, uh, the Glasgow University <coughs> Media Group. Um, we only have to think of the internationally famous Bad News tri Trilogy. I mean, really, I should call it not just internationally famous because it's it's been a mega success. I remember going into my daughter's um, sixth form college in London, Havering, and discovering there were all the bad news books in their library. Um, and this was followed up by the Glasgow Media Group Readers, volumes one and two, um, 
1995 and then Eldridge and Kevin Williams, I don't know if he's arrived yet, um, and um, uh, Jenny Kitzinger, uh, Mass Media and Power in Modern Britain in 1997. Um, at the time, this uh, trajectory seemed to me to be doing critically path-breaking work. Um, but I remember, too, that all was not sweetness and light when you launched the Bad News books. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that was bad news, more bad news, and really bad news. Um, so, to put it mildly, um, there was... Um, uh, some anger provoked by the publication of these books. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what was new about your method and why uh, this disquiet mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. provoked by their publication. Yes. Well, again, um, I want to pay tribute to Brian and also to mention uh, Paul Walton, who was uh, a firework of an intellectual and um, whose uh, who's passing we mourn. Um, but uh, it was Brian who knew so much about the technology of the, of the industry. And what we set about doing was to videotape uh, all the news broadcasts over a period of several months. And of course, and then we were going to embark upon a content analysis of of the of the output. Now this was a bit problematical for the broadcasters because before that people could write in and say, "Oh, I think there is this bias, or there is this trade unions too much power, or the management and this, that, and the other, and the government bias this way and that." But there had been no systematic analysis over an extended period of the actual content of news. And so we set out with this in this relatively new technology and which made provided a method that made it possible to analyze in great detail. I remember one critic talked about the Glasgow Media Group's galloping positivism, right? <laughs> uh, well, we, uh, that's all right. I mean, it, it meant that there was, it was heavily empirical. Um, and there's no harm in that. And, the, the, and it is true that we encountered difficulties both with ITV and with BBC. BBC. Mm -hmm. I remember the um, the, the uh, chairman of the um, governors of the BBC wrote to our then principal and said, this group need to be watched. They are politically naive. And... Um, so on and so forth. Now, I would not have known anything about that unless the principal himself had been kind enough to pass a letter on to me. <laughs> so I wrote to Sir Michael Swan and said he'd better deal with me in the future because I was the, the, the investigator in this case. And um, so eventually we, we saw him. He came up one day in um, incognito, as it were, and we had a meeting with him, and Brian will remember. And... Uh, and we said we said to him, "Well, what about the fact that in this in this strike of the, of the the dustbin workers in Glasgow, not one striker was interviewed? How about that for balance? How about that for objectivity?" He held his hands up, right. <laughs> and and this was the thing. So, uh, and I have to say that the 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 hostility was it was quite extraordinary. I mean, having been just industrial sociologist, I thought I'd been through quite a lot. But this was this was extraordinary. Uh, I, I gave a lecture once in the University of Warwick, and there were two people, one from BBC and one from ITV. And as soon as I finished, one of them started out and he said, you said the same thing in the University of Newcastle. And I said, well, truth doesn't alter either side of the Pennines, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it was just so I felt I'd been trailed around. And of course, if you look to the minutes of the meetings of the, of the BBC News and so on and so forth, you'd hear they were describing us as um, Trotskyists and things like that. 
and um, we were described as a, a shadowy guerrilla group and things like that. Quite remarkable. Now, I, what, 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 I, what I feel is that um, the kind of work we were doing was, uh, was a, a precursor of what is now called public sociology. Mm. In other words, it's research that was engaging with the public and not so much with the powerful. Mm. Um, and a sociology which is relevant, you have to ask what, what is it relevant mm. for and who is it relevant for? And the answer is it was relevant to the publics um, who wanted to know what kind of broadcasting system they're working under, especially since it's public service, public service broadcasting. And that importance of trying to understand you know, how public service broadcasting can be nurtured and sustained and can, as it were, deal with the ways in which it can it, 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 there's always a tendency for it to become elitist mm -hmm. and controlling and, you know, auntie knows best kind of thing. And that is what we challenged. And we did meet some difficulties head on. But we went out to trade unions and to churches and to other groupings. And we, we, we as it were, displayed this work. And, you know, people would say to us after they'd, they'd heard the accounts and they'd seen the material well this has opened my eyes I never thought of it like that and I never look at the news again in the same way and um, that's reward enough no, I think sure it yeah, is yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in 1979 um, after the Conservatives came to power you were president of the BSA British Sociological Association. Margaret Thatcher, as the political architect of the um, conservative revolution, um, was keen to restructure a number of institutions. <coughs> um, and she was particularly keen to restructure the Social Science Research Council, as it was then. Um, how did you respond to the Thatcher government challenge and how did you help orchestrate defensive <coughs> initiatives against it? Yeah. Well, make no mistake about it. Um, Margaret Thatcher was an enemy of sociology. That's putting it bluntly. And uh, so was her husband, you know, who had a fine career as... Um, breaking boycotts down in South Africa and all the rest of Rhodesia. And I, he's a fine man. And he, th th and they were determined to deal with this left-wing nonsense called sociology. And, um, and the word went out that something must be done. And, and what, one of the things that happened was that um, I think it was Sir Geoffrey Howe who got to uh, Lord Rothschild to, to do a report on what was in the Social Science Research Council and um, this report was, uh, was aimed to be the, the, as it were the nail in the coffin of sociology but I think that Lord Rothschild got wind of this and he didn't like to be a pawn in anybody's game so he um, he, wrote a, he, wrote, <laughs> he wrote a report which said Social sciences have been cut to the bone. We, can, we can't do this anymore. We have to um, sustain the social sciences, which was a bit of a shock for Geoffrey Howe and Margaret Thatcher. And um, nevertheless, they insisted that the Research Council be renamed the Economic and Social Research Council. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as sociology was concerned, we were very aware of cuts which were being made, and it, it was a very difficult time. And um, uh, very, very, very tricky indeed. But I think that we, we as it were, tried to gather our resources. And one of the things we did was to was to try and coordinate with other social science associations, a whole range of them. And we formed the the um, association for uh, learned societies in the social sciences. A bit of a mouthful. 
but that was a coordinating body which was aimed to defend the social sciences against political attacks. Mm. Um, and that was something which was was really important to do and uh, and as a matter of fact the academy for social sciences it now is is the is the inheritor of that kind of history really mm. so when we when i think back on on those 30 years they were pretty intense they had direct effects upon the departments and then you had people like um Roger Scruton, mm. who was a sort of apostle of um, of Mr. Thatcher, uh, and people like Roger Scruton who were um, having a real go at uh, sociology. He even came to a BSA conference on one occasion, and um, people were were slightly uh, rattled by this, but um, he didn't know about sociology. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm a little bit worried about the time. Yes. Uh, Andy, should uh, we finished within another sort of ten minutes or so? Is that all right? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. All right. Well, um, I was going to ask you a question about Williams, but um, maybe yes. we could just I say that in my talk. Yes, fine. That's fine. We can pass to him on another occasion. Um, I, I, I. I do think, John, that some of the issues uh, with which you have been deeply concerned um, are sadly, at the moment, no longer the subject of really vital public debate. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of industrial democracy, which you've spoken about so um, intriguingly. Uh, have um, sociologists using your approach anything to say, do you think, about the burning issues of our time, the burning political issues? Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, we can all think of some aspects of um, media studies, <coughs> yes, for example, yes, of yes, contemporary yes, Britain, which yes. you might want to allude to. Yes. Well, I think if I may just refer to the media group here for a, a minute or two, I think that the um, the work that we did back in the 90s on AIDS was really important. Mm. Um, and um, here I would like to uh, <coughs> refer people to the book which was which was uh, chiefly edited, uh, written by David Miller and um, Kevin Williams and so on. And one of the things about that was that <coughs> by this time we were able to move from a position where, from a position where we were not simply looking at the content of media messages, mm. but we're also looking at how the messages were produced, and at the other end of this, how they were being received. <coughs> and this question of how media messages are received is crucial. <coughs> we hear a lot of talk about effects of what are the effects of me media messages. But in order to actually establish that, it needs a very careful research, maybe using focus groups and whatever. Uh, and um, so the the AIDS research was an example of work which was on a a very public and very pressing issue. Um, but it, methodologically, it made the advance of trying to understand the process of communication through from production to content to reception. reception. And I think that's important. Um, much more recently, Greg, who has been terrific as a, as a director of the unit you know, over these last few years, what he has done is really quite remarkable. And I salute him and thank him for it. Um, and more recently, the, the, the more recent research has involved stuff on the Israel-Palestine dispute. Now, everybody can understand that with an issue like that, it's immensely controversial, and it's a political uh, time bomb, if you like, and, um, and it, sh it, it demands a certain amount of courage, actually, to do that kind of work. And um, uh, I know that Greg has been in receipt of some hostility in relation to that from mm. certain lobbies. 
Um, so I think that 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 example of um, the deep rooted problems in the Middle East um, serve as an example of um, of public sociology. And then, thirdly, I would mention climate change. I mean, climate change is a subject which um, uh, which again is fraught with controversy. <coughs> And I think throughout the work of the media group, it has it has routinely taken on controversial topics and tried to understand how they are presented and how they are communicated <coughs> and with the possibilities, not only of understanding, but also providing some kind of critique mm -hmm. as to um, why it is the way that it, that it is. Mm -hmm. So I think that... Um, these examples of more recent work, and the climate change work is, is now really in quite a good st advanced stage, I would say. Um, I think Catherine's here and she could tell us about that. <coughs> and I think that, um, again, they do serve as examples of public sociology, which is, you know, developing a kind of awareness and consciousness of the world in which we live through the use of sociological um, analysis and, uh, and investigation. So. Mm. Well, I think we should leave it there. I would like to thank John very profoundly for the fruits of his experience and the wisdom of his reflections. I think he is uh, one of the few sociologists um, alive at the moment who have had a great breadth of sociological investigation um, and this is unfortunately becoming even rarer I think at the moment uh, but it will be evident to all of you uh, that John's analytical clarity is unparalleled and um, we're very grateful for that both in his works over his life <coughs> and also particularly in the answers to the questions that I've asked him this afternoon. So thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you.